I can reckon easily enough, most holy father, as soon as certain people learn that in these books of mine which I have written about the revolutions of the spheres of the world, I attribute certain notions to the terrestrial globe, they will immediately shout to have me, in my opinion, hooted off the stage. For my own works do not please me so much that I do not weigh that judgment others will pronounce concerning them. And although I realize that the conceptions of the philosopher are placed beyond the judgment of the crowd, because it is his love and duty to seek the truth in all things insofar as God has granted that to human reason. Nevertheless, I think we should avoid opinions utterly foreign to rightness. And when I considered how absurd this lecture <laughs> would be held by those who knew that the opinion that the opinion that the earth rests immovable in the middle of the heavens as if their entire had as if their center had been confirmed by the judgments of many ages. If I were to assert to the contrary that the earth moves for a long time yeah, for a long time I was in great difficulty as to whether I should bring to the light my com commentaries or not even start over. Written <laughs> to, de <laughs> to demonstrate the earth's movements or whether it would not be better to follow the example of the Pythagoreans and certainly others who used to hand down the mysteries of their philosophy, not in writing but by word of mouth, and only to their relatives and friends. Witness the letter of Lysis to Hipparchus. They, however, seem to me to have done that not as some judge out of a jealous unwillingness to communicate their doctrines, but in order that things of very great beauty, which have been investigated by the love and care of great men, should not be scorned by those who find it a bother to expel any great energy on letters, except on the money-making variety, or who are provoked by the exhortations and examples of others to the liberal study of philosophy, but on account of their natural stupidity, hold the position among philosophers that drones hold among bees. Therefore, when I weighed these things in my mind, and scorn which I had to fear on account of the newness and absurdity of my opinion, I almost drove me to abandon a work already undertaken. But my friends made me change my course in spite of my long continued hesitation and ever resistance. First among them was Nicholas Schomburg, Cardinal at Capua, a man distinguished in all branches of learning. Next to him was my devoted friend, something, Bishop of something, a man filled with the greatest zeal for the divine and liberal arts, for he, in particular, urged me frequently and even spurned me on by added approaches in publishing his book and let him come to let a work which I had kept hidden among my things for not nearly nine years, but for almost four times nine years. Not a few others learned, and distinguished men demanded the same thing of me, urging me to refuse no longer on account of the fear which I felt, to contribute my work to the common utility of those who are really interested in mathematics. They said that the absurder my teaching about the movement of the earth now seemed to the very many persons the more wonder and thanksgiving will it be the object of one after the publication of my commentaries. Those same persons see the fog of absurdity dissipated <sighs> by my luminous demonstration. <laughs> Accordingly, I was led by such persuasion and let that hope finally to permit my friends to undertake the publication of a work which they had long sought for me. But perhaps your holiness will not be so much surprised I might have given the result of my nocturnal study to the light, after having taken such care in working them out that I did not hesitate to put in writing my conceptions as to the movement of the earth, as you will be eager to hear from me what came into my mind that in opposition to the general opinion of mathematics, and almost in opposition to common sense, I should dare to imagine some movement of the earth, and so I am unwilling to hide from your holiness that nothing, except my knowledge that mathematics have not agreed with one another in their researches, Move me to think out a different scheme of drawing up the movements of the spheres of the world. For in the first place, mathematicians are so uncertain about the movements of the sun and moon that they are that they can neither demonstrate nor observe the unchanging magnitudes of the revolving year. Then in setting up the solar and lunar movements and those of the other five wandering stars, they do not employ the same principles, assumptions, or demonstrations for revolutions and apparent movements. For some make use of homocentric circles, only others of eccentric circles and epicycles, by means of which, however, they do not fully attain what they seek. For although those who have put their trust in homocentric circles 
have shown that various different movements can be composed of such circles. Nevertheless, they have not been able to establish anything for certain that would fully correspond to the phenomena. But even if those who have thought of eccentric circles have the, seem to have been able, for the most part, to compute the apparent movements numerically by those means, they have, in the meanwhile, admitted a great deal which seems to contradict the first principle of regularity of movement. Moreover, they have not been able to discover or to infer the chief point of all the forms of the world and the certain commensurability of its parts, but they are in exactly the same fix as someone taken from different places, hands, feet, heads, and other limbs, very creepy, shaped very beautifully, but not with reference to one body and without correspondence to one another, so that such parts make up a monster rather than a man. And so, in the process of demonstration which they call method, they are found either to have omitted something necessary or to have admitted something foreign which by no means pertains to the matter and they would by no means have been its fix. If they had followed sure principles, for if the hypothesis they assumed were not false, everything which followed from the hypothesis would have been verified without fail. And though what I am saying may seem obscure right now, nevertheless it will become clearer in the proper place. Accordingly, when I had meditated upon his life of certitude and the traditional mathematics concerning the composition and movements of the sphere of the world, I began to be annoyed that the philosophers, who in other respects had made very careful scrutiny of the least details of the world, had discovered no sure scheme for the movements of the machinery of the world, which had been built for us by the best and most orderly workmen of all, hallelujah. Wherefore, I took the trouble to reread all the books by philosophers, which I could get hold of, to see if any of them even supposed that the movements of the spheres of the world were different from those laid down by those who taught mathematics in the schools. And as a matter of fact, I found first in Cicero that Nicetas thought that the earth moved. Yeah, and afterwards I found in Plutarch that there were some others of the same opinion. I shall copy out his words here so that he may be known to all. Some think that the earth is at rest, but... Someone, the Pythagorean, says it moves around the fire with an obliquely circular motion, like a sun and moon. Um, another dude and some other Pythagorean do not give the earth any movement or locomotion, but rather a limited movement arising and setting around its center. Oh, cool. We're making a video. So awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you want to read some of this? Yeah, absolutely. But you have to talk like a Baptist. Where from? I don't know how about Just... Where from? Where from? Therefore, I also <laughs> have having found an occasion, began to meditate upon the nobility of earth. And although the opinion seemed absurd, nevertheless, because I knew that others before me have been granted the liberty of constructing whatever circles they pleased in order to demonstrate astral phenomena. I thought I, that I too would be readily permitted to test whether or not by laying down that the earth had some movement, demonstrations less shaky than those of my predecessors could not be found for the revolutions of the celestial spheres. And so having laid down the movements which I attribute to the earth farther on in the work, I finally discovered by the help of a long and numerous observations that if the movements of the other wandering stars and correlated with the circular movement of the earth, and if the movements are computed in accordance with the, the revolution of each planet, not only do all their phenomena follow from that, but also from this correlation binds together so closely the order and the magnitudes of all the planets and of their spheres, or orbital circles and the heavens themselves, that nothing can be shifted around in any part of them without disrupting the remaining parts and the universe as a whole. Accordingly, in composing my work, I adopted the following order. In the first book, I described all the locations. Come on in! <laughs> <laughs> it's next time. Together with the movements. Oh, Alright. Okay. No. You gotta read it from there.
<laughs> yeah, use your favorite accent, I guess. Which are tribute to the earth. <laughs> so that this book contains, as it were, the general setup of the universe. <laughs> but afterwards, in the remaining books, I correlate in the move all the movements of the other planets and their spheres or orbital circles with the mobility of the Earth, <laughs> so that it can be gathered from that how far the apparent movements of the remaining planets and the orbital circles can be saved by being correlated with the movements of the Earth. I have no doubt that talented and learned mathematicians will agree with me if, as philosophy demands in the first place, they are willing to give <laughs> not superficial but profound thought and effort to what I bring forward. In this work, in demonstrating these things, and in order that the unlearned as well as the learned might see that I was not seeking to flee from the judgment of any Why? man, I preferred to dedicate these results of my nocturnal study to your holiness rather than to anyone else. Because, even in this remote corner of the earth, you are held to be the most eminent both of your dignity and your order. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Where was I? And in your love of letters, and even of mathematics. <laughs> Hence, by the authority of your judgment, you can easily provide a guard against the bites of slanderers, despite the proverb that there is no Pro medicine for the bite <laughs> of a sycophant. Amen. Amen. Lord have mercy. <laughs>